We think the biggest lever that we can pull when it comes down to glucose metabolism, when it comes down to how our cells use fuel is eat better. That's all we think, right? Okay, well, what can I eat to influence my insulin levels? What can I eat to influence glucose? But we forget the fact that the lifestyle factors are like the most important. That's the biggest lever that you can pull because that dictates how your cells see fuel. It dictates the lens in which your cells look at glucose, the lens in which your cells look at fat. And what I mean by that is a bad lifestyle is really going to make even a good diet not all that effective. And I know that sounds super like basic and kindergarten grade stuff, but let's dive into it. What are things that are making you worse at metabolizing carbohydrates? Let's jump in. The first one is one that's a little bit obvious, but we don't always look at the data, that's sleep. Okay, sleep deprivation affects how you metabolize carbohydrates probably, well, almost more than anything. There was a study that was published in the Journal of Clinical and Sleep Medicine. Fascinating study took a look at 21 individuals that were not diabetic, non-diabetic individuals that on average slept less than six and a half hours per night. Now what this study had them do is it said, okay, Part of the group, we want you to just go ahead and continue sleeping as usual. Sleep your cruddy amounts of sleep. The other group, we say, we want you to make a concerted effort to get six and a half hours of sleep. Try to get to six and a half hours. The results were flabbergasting. I love that word. Just a 60 minute increase of sleep for two weeks improved their glucose levels significantly. It improved their postprandial glucose response. They did not spike nearly as high after having carbohydrates and it improved what is called their HOMA IR. Okay, that is their, essentially their markers of insulin resistance, levels of insulin in their blood over a period of time. So those all improved just by getting up to six and a half hours of sleep. I don't think that's entirely unreasonable. Six and a half hours is not a lot of sleep, but I think it's doable for a lot of people. They also found that they produced more insulin in response to a very high carbohydrate meal, indicating that their body was responding the way that it was supposed to respond. But then there was another study that was published in the journal Diabetologia, and this was a two-week study that was very, very interesting as well. This one looked at time deviation in which people went to bed. So what that means is they measured, okay, here's what time someone goes to bed after midnight. And ultimately what they found is the later that someone went to bed, regardless of when they actually got up, it ended up negatively impacting glucose. So if they went to bed later, more insulin resistance and worse postprandial glucose modulation. They were unable to deal with the glucose better. Okay, now this one is really intriguing and this is probably the most important thing being sedentary. Now, before you skip ahead, because I know you want to, because you think, I know, but I'm not sedentary. I go to the gym. That's exactly the problem. You see, even when I was like, I don't know, probably not at my heaviest, but I was like 290 pounds or so, I was still going to the gym in the morning, but then I was working in the healthcare world and I was sitting down the rest of the day, like pounding monster energy drinks, just sitting down all day. That was my life. But I thought because I went to the gym and was active for an hour at work. Okay. So, they kind of lead us to believe that if as long as we get this 150 hours or excuse me, 150 minutes of activity per week, we're good. But in reality is even if you did like a two hour workout in the morning, but then you're totally sedentary, that could have a negative impact. Check out the research. The Journal of Science and Medicine and Sport published a paper, took a look at type two diabetics that were sedentary for seven hours, normal work day, right? Sitting down for seven hours and then they had them get up and do like three minutes of light activity at either 60 minute intervals, 30 minute intervals, or 15 minute intervals. Okay, no real surprise, the people that got up and moved just a tiny bit more frequently had marked improvement in their glucose and insulin. Their 21 hour area under the curve improved significantly, meaning overall, the amount of time that they were under their glucose curve or where they should be over the course of the day was hugely improved. Their postprandial uh, insulin and glucose levels were significantly improved and they overall just managed glucose better, period. Then there was another study that took a look at how glucose was actually managed when they actually consumed glucose and then were sedentary. This study was published in the journal Diabetes Care and they gave subjects 75 grams of pure glucose in a drink form, like, ugh. Okay, straight sugar, 75 grams, okay. And then they had them do a couple of different things. They said, okay, one group is going to sit for five hours, okay. 
Another group is going to sit for five hours, but every 20 minutes you're going to get up and do light activity. Another group is going to sit for five hours, but every 20 minutes you're going to get up and do moderate activity. Well, guess what? The area under the curve for those that got up every 20 minutes was significantly better, as well as their insulin levels significantly, not a little bit, but significantly better. And guess what? Dose dependent on the activity level. So what that meant is the people that got up every 20 minutes and did moderate activity ended up having significant improvements in their insulin and glucose levels. So what does this mean for you? Does it mean that you need to pop up out of your chair every 20 minutes and do 100 burpees? No. It's very simple. Light exercise was literally just walking around the office. Getting up every 20 minutes and go bother your neighbor in the cubicle next door or something. Something simple, right? Whatever. Moderate activity might be maybe doing some air squats. Yeah, you might look like a weirdo for a little bit, but you know what? Who is going to be laughing when you're feeling better at age 80, right? That's the point. Get up, get active for a little bit. That is what breaks that sedentary pattern. And if you're wearing something like a continuous glucose monitor like I do, you can see it firsthand. Okay, if I have carbohydrates and I sit down, I get a warning, a literal warning from my continuous glucose monitor and from Cygnos that says, your glucose is spiking, get up and move. But if I consume carbohydrates and then I'm walking, I don't get that alert. Pretty crazy, right? And this is monitoring it in real time. I put a link down below for Cygnos if you want to try them out. I definitely recommend you do. If you're someone that's monitoring your metabolism, monitoring glucose, paying attention to these things for weight management, for cognitive function, for all these things you pay attention to, Cygnos is crazy cool. So it gets you access to a Dexcom continuous glucose monitor. So you wear the continuous glucose monitor, which is super cool in and of itself. So that beams in real time my glucose. I can look at my phone, see what my glucose level is, see how I respond to food, see how I respond to sitting down. Down, which is always crazy because when I go to bed, my glucose tends to spike because all of a sudden, guess what? I'm sedentary. All these things are cool, but then Cygnos uses really cool coaching technology and algorithmic technology to learn your specific zones and where you should be as an individual. And it recognizes when you're going out of your range above or below and it starts crafting things. You can log your food with it. It is so universal. And I put a link down below that's going to save you 15% off. So use that code down below to save 15% off Cygnos if you want to try them out. Again, that gets you the consult, that gets you the CGM, the continuous glucose monitor, and it gets you access to the app that does all the fun hard work for you. So that link is down below using that code to save 15% off your order with Cygnos. Now, along with this whole thing, we think, okay, but I'm not an active person. Is this still going to work for me? And like, how long does it take? Like, can I just start exercise and get the benefit? And the short answer is yes. But on the same coin, or on the other side of that same coin, we find that if you stop, you lose it, okay? So this study was published in the journal Applied Physiology. It took a look at relatively trained people, people that would exercise, and they had them not train for 10 days, okay? The day after that 10-day non-training period was done, they found that their insulin levels essentially doubled. Okay, they more than 2x their insulin levels to deal with carbohydrates, meaning they basically became twice as insulin resistant by ceasing exercise for 10 days. That scares it, right? That scares me. Does it scare you? So what do we do here? Well, the good news is they found one single bout, one single bout of exercise brought them right back to where they were before. Okay? So the point is, is yes, you might go on vacation for 10 days, sit totally on your bum and hang out on the beach. But the reality is that'll come back fast as long as you get right back into the rhythm of not being sedentary. Sedentary activity will flip-flop and reverse all the good work you've been doing. Don't let that happen. Now we have to look at the saturated fat piece. Now this is so interesting because it irritates people. They don't want to hear that saturated fats are bad because it feels like it goes against the grain of what we've been trying to push for the last 10 years. But the reality is saturated fats in total excess are not good for insulin resistance, straight up. And if you're already walking that path towards insulin resistance, you need to be extra careful. And I'm sorry, people might get upset because low carb stuff, you like the cheese. I'm sorry, I look at the data and this is how it works, period, okay? When you are already insulin resistant, what happens is the adipose tissue, the adipocytes, the cells, they don't respond to insulin either. So that means the saturated fat that you consume isn't getting stored in the fat cell. At first, that sounds great. Hey, I can eat fat and not store it, except for the fact that then those lipids stay circulating through the bloodstream for a long period of time. And what happens is they eventually wind up in the skeletal muscle. Okay, they go into the muscle. So you end up with muscle that is marbled with fat, like a beautiful Wagyu steak in your bicep. 
You don't want that. You want it on a Wagyu steak, you don't want it in your arm, okay? So now you have marbled fat in your arm, and that fat in your muscle is making you more insulin resistant because it impedes the insulin signal. So I know you like your cheese, and I'm not saying you cannot eat it, but keep it to 20% or less of your total fat calories. Just do me a favor on that, okay? When you prevent that insulin signaling, you're driving yourself further down that path of insulin resistance. That's not good. Okay? Now, there was a study that was published in the journal Endocrinology that was very fascinating. It was an in vitro study, but don't worry, I have a human study after this to talk about. In this in vitro study, they combined high carbohydrates, glucose, along with saturated fat, along with pancreatic cells. Guess what? Apoptosis. It killed the pancreatic cells. It triggered them to die. Then they put polyunsaturated fats, like fish oil, things like that, along with high glucose levels in a petri dish with these cells. Only mildly toxic, still cause some damage. Then they put monounsaturated fats, like from olive oil and avocado oil, along with sugar, along with glucose, in a petri dish with pancreatic cells. No damage, no toxicity. Okay, that kind of tells us what could be going on. Okay, for whatever reason, saturated fat and glucose do not mix well together. Not something you want to be combining a lot of. But let's look at a human model because we have to do that. Well, there's a study published in the journal Diabetologia that took a look at subjects that ate a high saturated fat diet. It looked at their insulin resistance levels, it looked at all this stuff. And what they did is they simply swapped out their saturated fat for polyunsaturated fat. And guess what? This isn't some plant-based movement. I'm not trying to say that because you get polyunsaturated fats from guess what? Fish. Okay, so I'm not suggesting you go plant-based. I'm not even saying that at all. So don't go there. I know you're thinking it. Okay, but if you cut out the saturated fat or reduce it and swap it out with the polyunsaturated fat in this particular group, guess what? Significant improvements in insulin resistance, improvements in insulin sensitivity rather, okay, and reductions in abdominal fat. So simply put, subbing polyunsaturated fats instead of the saturated fats led to improved insulin sensitivity, reduced insulin resistance, and reduced abdominal fat. So that's pretty awesome, and that's a human model study right there. Now we move into the last one, which is really wild, and it's a little bit of a twist, so let's dive in. It's blue light. And you're going to turn off the video right now because you get tired of hearing about blue light. That's not real. Blue light doesn't do it. It's not real. Okay, sure. The sun is blue light. Like, it's real. Okay? We recognize blue light. We recognize red light. I know you don't want to admit it. I know that you think it only comes down to, like, the sugar and the stuff that we eat, but no. The body recognizes light, plain and simple. Do a quick search on PubMed and you will see it is legit. A study published in PLOS1 took a look at 19 subjects. So with these 19 subjects, they had them consume blue light, like soak up blue light 10 and a half hours after waking, so as the day was winding down. What they found was that the more blue light people ended up taking in, that affected their postprandial glucose dramatically. It affected how they responded to glucose. Now you might be thinking, oh, well they got a bunch of blue light in so they didn't sleep well. Er, not in this study. They took a look at people that soaked up more blue light, but it did not impact their sleep. So it was solely dependent upon the blue light without the effect of sleep, okay? So blue light itself impacted how they metabolized glucose. Why? Because we are disrupting signals. If we are taking in blue light at night when we also have melatonin cues happening, that is a gene expression nightmare of all kinds of different things that are expressing and activating when they shouldn't be because they're conflicting. So you end up with what? A smorgasbord of metabolic dysfunction. And that makes perfect sense because blue light is a natural diurnal cue. Okay, it's an environmental cue that allows us to process how we should process. So just to recap, okay, sleep, get more sleep. I used to think it was cool to get up at 4 a.m. because I thought I was being super hard and it was awesome, right? The reality is I'd rather get another hour of sleep and feel better. Don't be sedentary. Get up every 20, 30 minutes and move for a minute or two. That's all it takes. Swap out these saturated fats for some more mono and polyunsaturated fats. I'm not saying don't eat the steak. I'm saying swap it out and get some more fats now and then and make it better. And lastly, reduce the blue light. Try, at least after like 6 p.m., cut it out or put some blue light blocking glasses on and look like a weirdo. Whatever. It's fine. At least it works. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't have a Wagyu bicep.